Buddhist art historian Giorgio Vasari gave the art of the Byzantine East a lousy press. It was crude, unsophisticated, primitive. And I sometimes wonder, although he wrote 500 years ago, I wonder if we haven't taken him too much at his word. I don't think I've ever seen a television programme about the art of Byzantium. Certainly, the subject is abbreviated to a few simplifications in most histories of world art. And yet, the art that was produced in the East was amongst the most vibrant, colourful and energetic that the world's ever seen. I want to explore that tradition, to tell its story. But it's a story that begins here, in a city called Istanbul, that was once called Constantinople. This modern, chaotic port city was once the very centre of a dynasty so powerful that it seemed immune to change and decay. But nothing lasts forever. And the story of how a once great Christian empire grew and spread from this place, how it reached its zenith, how it faded and died, all that is reflected in the radiant, shape-shifting forms of its art. It was Emperor Constantine, the earliest Christian Roman emperor, who first came here in 324 AD, when this place was known as Byzantium. Strategically situated on the banks of the Bosphorus, the city straddles Europe and Asia. Emperor Constantine changed its name to Constantinople. In this mosaic of the 6th century, he's seen offering the new capital to God and, by the same token, seeking God's protection for his new empire in the east. The thousand-year period that followed would become known as the Byzantine era, with Constantinople its most important centre for political and cultural thought. As well as establishing a whole new Roman headquarters, Constantine brought with him the new religion known as Christianity. The marriage between Christianity and the people of the Byzantine world would create some outstanding works of art and architecture. Buildings and images designed to convince those who experienced them that the Christian faith was indeed the one true path to salvation. It's an irony of fate and history that many great churches, such as the Hagia Sophia, were later transformed into mosques but their origins are very definitely Christian. There's no greater monument to the might and the splendour of the once glorious Byzantine civilization than this great cathedral, the Hagia Sophia. Walking in is a sense-stunning experience, this great dome raised up above you into the vault of heaven almost as extraordinary as the sheer physical presence of the place is the fact that it was all built in just five years. In the past, this place was the most prestigious building of the Byzantine Empire and the centre of what came to be known as Orthodox Christianity. This building dates from the early 6th century and is a testament to one of the most important figures of the Byzantine Empire, Emperor Justinian I. His rule coincided with what might be described as the Golden Age of Byzantium, a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity that made possible the very creation of the Hagia Sophia. The original scheme was very simple on the evidence of what survived basic crosses, and almost nothing figurative. Whether this was a planned effect of sobriety and restraint, or merely a way of getting the building finished on time, we'll never know. What is certain is that the building of the Hagia Sophia changed the course of world architecture. Its massive dome, seemingly suspended in mid-air, appears to defy gravity, having no obvious means of support. The dome of this building is uh, 32 metres across. Uh, we do, of course, have the 
dome of the Pantheon in, in Rome, uh, which is larger, but uh, this is a much more daring architectural construction. Well, I, can, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about what someone from Rome would have thought coming to this place. They would have had the Pantheon in their mind, but what, what I assume would have struck them would have been that, yes, you've got a dome as big as the Pantheon's dome, but it's been sort of vertically propelled, <laughs> and, and it's surrounded by this other huge architectural fabric. Absolutely, uh, and uh, uh, if, if you think about the Pantheon in particular, the dome is supported on a continuous wall, it's on a, on a drum. Here we've got something quite different. When you go into the church, it's very difficult to see just how the dome is supported because uh, everything is veiled behind colonnades, so the, the main piers really don't stand out when you're looking at the interior of the building. Do, do you think, it, I mean, I think that's a very interesting point, do you think it might have struck your ordinary Byzantine bloke as a kind of feat of divine, miraculous engineering, you know, visible, tangible evidence that this guy must have God on his side, oh. otherwise how could he float something like that? I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. In Byzantine imperial philosophy, the, the emperor was God's representative on earth. By building a cathedral like this on such a massive scale, Justinian was making the point that his power was uh, supported by God. The Church of the Hagia Sophia is an architectural marvel that became the great church of the Byzantine Empire, which at the time of Emperor Justinian I stretched from modern-day Turkey in the east to Spain in the west. The work created in Constantinople was the alpha and omega of Byzantine art, but tragically many of its very earliest masterpieces have been lost. For centuries, the traditions forged in Constantinople shaped European art. And you can see the extent of its impact in the satellite cities of the empire. One of the key Byzantine centers was Thessaloniki in modern-day northern Greece. Nestling beside the sea, in a natural harbour, it was a crucial outpost of the empire. A thriving port today, as it was in the 5th and 6th centuries, its prosperity was built on maritime trade. Such was its strategic importance that Emperor Constantine almost chose it as his first city over Constantinople. He was probably right not to, as this was a city under constant threat of invasion. But it's the fact that it was under almost permanent siege that lends the art that developed here its particularly intense quality. This part of town is built up now, a honeycomb of streets and houses. But 1,500 years ago, these were fields perched above the city. And standing alone at the summit of the hill was a monastery dedicated to St. David. Inside is the Church of Osias David, which contains a stunning 6th century mosaic in near pristine condition. A fascinating glimpse of the forces shaping Christian art in the early Byzantine world. It's a work of art that shows us very clearly how strong the Greco-Roman tradition, the Hellenistic tradition of culture and art was in this city, because it doesn't really look like a Byzantine mosaic, if one thinks of Byzantine mosaics as having lots of gold and glitter, the colours are very low, this muted, beautiful muted blues and reds and greens, and the modelling of the figures is very sculptural. And if you look at that central figure of Christ, you can really sense the way in which the artist is taking the powers of the old gods, the pagan gods, and giving them to the new Christian god. The subject's taken from the Book of Revelations. It's the vision of Ezekiel. And you can see Ezekiel on the left-hand side, this urgent, crouching figure with his hand to his ear, experiencing this great vision of Christ. And we see Christ surrounded by the attributes of his evangelists. There's Mark the lion, Matthew the angel, John the eagle, and Luke the ox. 
it was actually quite a new subject for an artist to be taking on in the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century because the book of Revelations had only relatively recently been accepted into the canon of Christian texts. But the message of the image was unambiguous. The end of the world is nigh. Pray and repent. Get your spiritual house in order or you won't be saved. Now this image acquired even more potency later in the city's history because by the 9th century this monastery was in a relative state of disrepair and the image itself had long been covered over and forgotten about. Now the story goes that an old monk was in here one day sheltering from a storm when suddenly an earthquake struck. There was a shattering noise behind him. All the covering fell away and this image suddenly appeared. The monk was so devastated that he actually died on the spot. As a result of this act of divine intervention, this place became a site of pilgrimage. Thousands would come here to look at this image, which they believed had actually been created by God himself, in the belief that they might almost touch divinity by looking at it. <laughs> The character who came to dominate the imagination of Thessalonians in the Byzantine era, perhaps even more than Christ himself, was their patron saint, the spiritual protector Saint Demetrius, as can be seen in the church dedicated to him. The church dates back to the 5th century, and although it was extensively renovated following a fire in 1917, some of the 6th and 7th century mosaics that can still be seen here are among the best surviving examples of early Byzantine art. What's most interesting about them is the emphasis they place on Demetrius himself, a warrior saint whose life and legends are enshrouded in myth, but who came to seem as present and actual as a real father or brother to the people who lived here. In Byzantine culture, the emperor himself was so closely associated with Jesus that the people at large felt they didn't have the right to approach Christ directly. Their emperor was the only mortal with a direct hotline to God, so they had to approach a figure rather lower down the divine hierarchy. And in Thessaloniki, that was Saint Demetrios. They'd pray to him in the hope that he'd pass the message upstairs and their wishes would be granted. A pattern of belief touchingly reflected in this image of him sheltering the children of the city. These mosaics show the devotion of Byzantine communities to their chosen saints. And because Thessaloniki was so regularly besieged, this was a city that needed a never-ending supply of miracles. Reading through the annals of the city, it seems that St. Demetrius was forever saving the people of Thessaloniki from one disaster or another. In times of plague, they'd pray to him and be miraculously cured. Or if the city was being invaded, he'd come to their aid. On one occasion, the Slavs attacked by night, and suddenly his church burst into flames, waking up all the people. They put out the fire, realised they were being attacked, and repelled the invaders. Once again, St. Demetrius had come to their aid. But my favourite story concerns a particularly mischievous deacon called Onesiphoros, who was in the habit of sneaking into the sacristy at night and stealing the candles. Candles were worth a lot of money in those days. Then, one night, while he was about this dastardly deed, the voice of St. Demetrius boomed out, Onesiphorus, you're at it again! The moral of the story being, as ever, that St. Demetrius has his eye on you at all times. And this is where St. Demetrius lies. Local people come each day to worship in the shrine that's said to contain his body and to ask for their prayers to be answered. Thessalonians still look to St. Demetrius for their help, protection and spiritual well-being.